morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mark, for the awesome introduction. How many key words can you get into an introduction? Um, my name is Steve Bates. I'm very, 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 very happy to be here. Very excited to talk on this topic. Um, and uh, I'm not alone. So uh, I have the great pleasure of uh, presenting today with Paul, Paul from Cray. And uh, I should also acknowledge that there's a couple of other suspects who've been heavily involved in prepping this material. Uh, and that's uh, Tom Talpy from Microsoft and, and Doug Voigt from HPE. Uh, Doug couldn't make it today. We tried to get everyone together for the question session. Doug basically didn't want to do it and ran away. So we got Andy Rudolph from Intel to come in. And Andy, I think everybody agrees, is just much more handsome than Doug. <laughs> you can tell where this talk's going. So you know, we're going to talk about persistent memory. And, and I think one of the things that we want to focus on in today's talk is not really about the native raw bits and bytes. So we will touch on the, you know, the characteristics of the low-level bits and bytes. But I think you know, what we want to talk about today is connecting applications to those bits and bytes. Because we've seen a lot of material around, you know, 1,000 times faster than NAND, you know, um, much, much better latencies. The, que you know, the question that you pose, though, is you, know, you can build this awesome stuff, but what does it actually mean in terms of meaningful acceleration application or meaningful user experience? What is it going to mean in terms of day-to-day -day people who are trying to navigate through traffic or trying to understand the data that's coming into their business or trying to make decisions that are going to impact their lives? And I think what we want to talk about today is some of the work that's happening to start connecting these very fancy new bits and bytes up to the applications going through the operating systems and some of the common libraries and stacks that are available. On top of that, we also want to talk a little about how do you connect to this persistent memory. Some of it's going to be expensive. Some of it's going to be in a form factor you may not want to put in every single server that's in your center. Right? Maybe you need to share it from a pool resource that's somewhere. So we maybe want to connect to it over some kind of network or fabric. And that's something that we've been doing an awful lot of work on. And uh, Paul here is probably going to focus more on, on that side of things. So here's who we are. We are the suspects. And the first thing I'd like everybody to do in the room is to give themselves a big pat on the back, right? Because we have come a long way, baby, right? If I look at where we've come from a storage point of view, um, you know, the amounts of improvements that we've made in key metrics is phenomenal. And I love this picture. This is a picture. It's circa 1955, maybe 56. And this is an EVAC 350 IBM system that's getting shipped to a customer. This is a hard drive. This is one of the first commercially shipped hard drives. There's probably people in this room who know more about the history of this device than I do. But from what I can understand, this thing was about five megabytes of data, and it weighed about a ton. And in today's money, they were charging about 30,000 US dollars a month to lease it. OK? So five megabytes and a ton. Yesterday, I think it was yesterday, SanDisk announced a one terabyte SD card. That's one terabyte in about two grams, or about a tenth of an ounce. So if you do the math on that, and I did, it's about 10 orders of magnitude improvement in bits per ounce, right? which is a metric that nobody should ever use, but I've, I'm going to use it here. So you know, there's also lots of other metrics that are associated with that, probably how much data can I fit in a physical unit area, very important for Data, you know, data density, and obviously cost has also come down incredibly over the days. Right? So we've come a very long way, baby, um, and uh, we should congratulate ourselves from that. But today's talk is not about the past. It's not even about the present. It's really about where are we going, and where we're going is a world of persistent memory. So one of the first things I want to do is talk about what we think are some of the attributes that define per persistent memory. Because we do have a little bit of a confusion right now around taxonomy. And I have a slide on taxonomy in, a, in, in just a second. But and maybe not everyone in the room will agree with what I, you know, myself and the others are going to say here. But I think there's three main attributes that define a persistent memory. Right? The first one is low latency. Okay? And the reality is, if you don't care about latency, you shouldn't be using persistent memory technology. We have lots of ways of doing byte addressable access to things that, as long as you don't care about how long it takes, you can go do it, right? We MAP files all the time. Those files live on block devices. Those block devices are not byte addressable, but I can write byte addressable code. 
Okay, the operating system takes care of it all, it does all the crap that's in the way, and the reality is the performance sucks, but if you don't care about latency, then that's okay. We can solve that problem today. So you probably wanna care about latency for persistent memory, and luckily these memory technologies do have excellent latency numbers. Memory semantics, right? We have NAND flash today. It's not byte addressable, right? I cannot go and do a read, modify, write on flash. Believe it or not, it won't let you. You've got to erase the block to program the page. And that very simple statement creates many, many headwicks for SSD firmware developers, many of you, I'm sure, are in this room. And I've been in that horrible world of trying to take something where the operating system wants to write randomly to me, and I cannot write randomly to the media that's behind. That's one of the things those wonderful NVMe controllers, companies like ours and Intel and Samsung and others make, that abstract away for you, the user, so that you can work with the flash um, while we hide some of those intricacies, right? But the new memory technology isn't like that. It's, it's maybe not byte addressable, but it's much more accessible than NAND flash. And it also has um, the ability to change it in place, typically, right? So memory semantics. And the third thing, of course, is storage features. Without storage features, I'm talking about DRAM. Right? Storage features include probably most fundamentally persistence. Right? That's a pretty important storage feature. If you're trying to store stuff and it's not persistent, you're going to have probably some reliability issues. Other storage features are around things like data integrity. Am I actually getting the data back that I thought I'm getting? We have ways of doing data integrity. Maybe there's things like redundancy, high availability, protection, RAID. All these are augmentation features, but I think the main one is obviously persistence. So these are the three things that we think are important for persistent memory, and we can obviously argue about that. As long as you buy me a beer, I'll argue with you about this for as long as you'd like. Taxonomy. So this slide, this taxonomy is Jim Pappas approved. I don't know if everyone in the room knows who Jim Pappas is. If you don't, you should find out who he is, but Jim is very influential in the areas around non-volatile memory and persistent memory. And uh, as we put together this slide, we probably spent more time on this slide than any other slide in the whole day. <laughs> and, uh, and then at the end, I had dinner with Jim last night, and I said, I want to put Jim Pappas approved on this slide. So I apologize, because I didn't get a chance to warn everyone ahead of time. So beat me up, my fellow colleagues, if, or my fellow authors, if you didn't like it. But I put that in, and that's a picture of Jim with a mustache, which he doesn't have today. So I'm not gonna go through this in a lot of detail. Persistent memory, you know what we talked about. Non-volatile memory for me is everything solid state, so it's a, it's a superset of PM that includes NAND. NVMe, block-based storage, it's a protocol, it's not a media. NVMP is the non-volatile memory programming model. That's something that SNEA has been working on and uh, Doug will be touching on in a little bit. NVMe over fabrics is an interesting one because um, there's a lot of different, I've seen like eight different ways of, of abbreviating it. Um, this one here, NVMF, I think is the non-official one, but I like it, and so I'm going to get it, put it in my deck. There needs to be an E in there. No, apparently, officially, there needs to be an E in there, but I, anyway, uh, one to discuss over the pub. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk a little about what we mean by low latency. So this slide is leveraged from a great web page, which is, I think if you Google timing values every programmer should know, this will be the top hit, and it's awesome. I go back to this website all the time. Uh, I keep a copy of it like on my, on my laptop, because it reminds me how quickly do things happen on the typical processor, right? This is, these numbers are not precise, you know, they're, they're architecture dependent, to, to, and some, you know, some architectures may not even have caches, right? It's, you know, but this gives you a rough idea of how quickly can I get at my data, assuming it's in a certain place on my CPU architecture. So it tells me, you know, where, where time-wise do we live? L1 cache read, very, very, very quick, right? About half a nanosecond, roughly. And relatively, I call that one, okay? L2 cache, seven, and so on, and so on. And you can see, interestingly, even DRAM relative to an L1 cache hit is pretty expensive, right? And now, sometimes your DRAM is gonna do better than 100 nanoseconds, but sometimes it's gonna do worse. There's a lot of things that are happening in the integrated memory controller. and A lot of things can be happening in the DRAM. There's even a quality of service thing. You're not gonna get the same access time all the time. That's a quality of service issue, and, and that hits you all the way through the stack. Right? And then we have an absolutely massive jump. We go from a relative of 200 to a relative of 20,000. 
And that's to go to not just an NVMe SSD, but an NVMe SSD that's built out of DRAM. So the backing mechanism of that NVMe SSD is pretty much very, very well, infinite, not infinitely fast. It's incredibly fast, right? Much faster than NAND. The Optane products that have been announced by Intel with some public numbers that they've shown, they'll be around this place. They'll be around the 10 microseconds, the, the 20,000 ticks, right? Uh, and then if you go to NAND, which you're going to want to because NAND is an awful lot cheaper than DRAM, and it will probably be quite a bit cheaper than Optane or other next-gen memory products. Um, it, it's another order of magnitude and, and some more on top. And then finally going to hard drives, uh, we're up at the million mark. So you can see that there's a gap there, and that gap I think is really what the applications want to take advantage of. There's a gap between the DRAM read at 200 and the NVMe DRAM read at 20,000. And I think, I truly believe there will be new companies that are going to be ending up as big as Google's and Facebook's and whatever, because they'll be the companies that work out how do I monetize the, per the persistent memory opportunity, right? And part of that is going to be happening because we basically turn on the ability for applications to be written that can take advantage of the persistent memory opportunity. So what are some of the pieces that everyone in this room has to work on to, to basically allow this PM opportunity to occur? Oh, well, I'll get to that in a second. So in terms of where we are, this is where I think we are, right? We're crawling. I think when it comes to persistent memory, we've basically started down a path that I truly think will be incredibly transformative. And I think it's going to take us like 10, 15 years. I mean, look at the hard drive in 1955 and where we are today. Right? It takes time. NAND flash started back in the early 80s. Look where we are today, right? It takes time. It takes time for everything to evolve. I think we're at the beginning of something. I think it's going to be incredibly disruptive. I think it could be as disruptive as anything we've seen in computer architecture and storage environments for 20 years. And, 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 and we have a lot of work to do to get to the point where we're flying. So again, something we can argue about over a beer, um, but I think we're kind of here. And then in terms of what's needed, I think we can break it down to what I call the PM jigsaw. So these are some of the, these are the parts that we need to work on, put together, uh, in order to basically enable applications to take advantage of the PM opportunity. We have media and form factor. Of course you need bits that are byte addressable and are incredibly low latency. And there are multiple memory companies on the planet and startups and you know, foundries and others that are working on a variety of different techniques to get us memory with those particular attributes. Right? Optane is one that Intel and Micron have publicly announced. There are others, right? We have Xenon recently from Samsung. We have the MRAMs from the Everspins and Globals. There's, there's many, many of them, right? We also have to package it in a form factor, right? Giving me raw memory die, it doesn't really help me if I'm a processor. I need to hang it off a bus. I need to have a protocol that communicates over that bus. Is that bus a cache coherent bus? Is it not? Is it PCIe? Is it not? These are things that we need to decide and we need to standardize because if we don't standardize them, they're gonna be niche. If they're niche, they're expensive. If they're expensive, you don't adopt it. If you don't adopt it, it's, it's worthless, right? So we need to think about that. We need operating system support. Without operating system support, the applications can be written in weird and wonderful ways. If they can't communicate with the media, it's useless. So we need people at Microsoft, VMware, Linux, other operating systems. They need to be hooking the hardware to the application level software. Protocols and intricate, I've always touched on. And then another one we need is, and this is something that um, Andy has been doing some great work on at, at Intel and, and others have as well, is we need libraries and tool chains. If I'm writing application code, I'm writing Java, right? Or maybe C, though a lot of people these days are writing Java apparently at the cool places, right? Or Go or whatever, all these languages I've known, you know, I've already, they are not, even aware of what they're running on, right? They are very abstracted from the underlying, right? They want to be able to do things like we do today with printf, right? If I do printf in a C program, I don't care if I'm on a VM, I don't care if I'm on an Intel, I don't care if I'm running Linux, I just know if I do a GCC, it's going to compile to the object code for that particular ISA and it's going to run. And there's a reason why, right? The operating system and standard library guys have worked together for many years to make sure there's a tool chain that's going to work for me and it's going to work for me no matter what. We need the same thing 
for persistent memory. So that being said, now that I've introduced the components, Paul is going to take us through where they sit in the stack, and he's also going to talk about some of the parts of the stack, and I will be back in a little bit. Which button is which here? Forward is the one on the right. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about the theory of general relativity, but I may say some things that sound a little unusual to you, so maybe that will be a, a good compromise. Um, if we take those moving parts that Stephen talked about, the puzzle, and try to break it down a little bit into what the pieces are, you get a picture that sort of begins to start looking like this. When we talk about applications, um, I use the expression consumer more than application. It's the consumer of whatever the service is that's being provided, whether it's uh, non-volatile memory or whether it's persistent memory or whatever it is. And that includes user space applications. It also includes kernel applications. And it also includes, importantly, the category of communications middleware, like MPI libraries, for example. Below that, there's a set of protocols and interconnects, which I sort of lump together and call APIs. And this is the first of the number of places where I'm going to say something that may be a little unusual to you, in that the emphasis on APIs. I mean, the reason I do that is because very often, an API is assumed to be associated directly with a particular wire. So often it's the case that a wire is developed and an API is put on top of that wire and it's delivered to the consumer for its use. What we're doing in the Open Fabrics Alliance here is taking a little, a little bit different point of view. We're starting from the consumer, working our way down to finding an API with the hope that a wire emerges beneath it that meets the needs of the API. So I'm going to harp on that just a little bit. Um, the next part of the so-called infrastructure part is the actual you know, interconnect, the physical parts of it, the drivers, um, you know, the underlying wire, that sort of thing, the stuff that we're all familiar with and that we can put our hands on and feel good about touching. And then beneath that is the physical device itself, the, the form factor of the media. Sorry? Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is the way I, I sort of look at the problem. Um, but that only helps a little bit. The problem is actually even more complex than the one that Stephen laid out for us. Uh, in that, the problem that we're dealing with is that persistent memory, you know, the question is, well, you know, where does the 800-pound gorilla sit? The answer is anywhere it wants to. Uh, and that's the case with persistent memory as well. It can be attached locally via a memory bus of some sort. It can be attached via an I.O. bus. Um, or importantly, it can be attached via a fabric. And that's where my particular interests lie in the fabric world. So I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. But it, it leads for sort of a complex problem. And, and the problem is exacerbated somewhat, boy, there's a big word, uh, exacerbated somewhat by the fact that these interconnects, in some cases, are controlled by the platform that the device runs on. So not all of these are standard uh, ports, if you will, or, or I.O. ports. Some of them, so that we have a sort of a, a multi-dimensional complex problem we have to deal with here. So take that other picture um, that I showed a minute ago, and what do engineers do best? We break problems down into smaller bite-sized chunks, and then we find ways to attack those chunks kind of in pieces. And that's what this picture here, really here is all about. At the top, the consumer layer, there's lots of work going on here. SNEA is obviously uh, deep into this with the programming model working group and other areas there. And there's lots of things going on in the OSV world and, and other places, storage developers and so on, people that consume storage services or persistent memory services in this case. Uh, below that is the API, and again, this is where I'm going to harp on this just a little bit. The important part about this is that the API is what exports the function that the consumer itself can access. Uh, to take advantage of the service that's offered by, by the device, whether it's, again, persistent memory or some other form of storage. So the API turns out to play a sort of a key role here, maybe more key than has been the case in the past. And the key players here, um, I'm going to mention the Open Fabrics Alliance. And the reason I'm going to pick on that one is because of that group of people there that are thinking about APIs. And by the way, there are others beyond this. But the Open Fabrics Alliance is the only one that thinks about, at least as far as I know, thinks about APIs purely from a consumer perspective. It says, you know, we're not tied to a wire in particular. We want to know what API should we be talking about developing such that it exports functions to the consumer that are most usable to the consumer. So it's not tied to any particular wire. There are other efforts going on with respect to APIs. Uh, NVMe, for example, is working on some APIs. NVMe F, is that what we're using today, Stephen? I have no idea what we're using today. <laughs> NVMe F. <laughs> um, and, you know, APIs are developed in the operating systems themselves. 
uh, Linux and Windows and so on. Missing from this list, and it's a point of confusion that I'd like to try to clear up a little bit, is the IBTA. Missing from the API list, and the reason is because the IPA, IBTA, InfiniBand, does not define an API. The InfiniBand specification defines verbs, which is a semantic behavior exported by the InfiniBand wire that's accessible to the, the consumer, but it is not an API. The, the verbs version of the API, the API version of the verbs is developed and supported by the Open Fabrics Alliance. That's a source of confusion that comes up quite often. So I just wanted to touch on that. Next layer down at the infrastructure layer, uh, three different flavors of infrastructure we need to talk about. One is networks, the other is I.O. buses, and the third is memory buses of some sort. And the key players here, I've listed, again, not all of them, but the ones that seem to have the most air time these days, the IETF, the IBTA, PCIe, SIG, um, the OS, from the perspective that they develop drivers and so on. But these are the heavy hitters that are talking about the physical characteristics of the underlying wire itself. And at the very bottom are the vendors uh, and JEDEC, you know, people who are actually developing physical devices that you can put your fingers on and play with. So for me, it starts at the top, works its way down. And the whole point behind this slide was just to say that there's really two different kinds, clear distinctions, at least in my mind, of consumers of non-volatile memory. Uh, and I think this is becoming clear, but I think it kind of bears harping on just a little bit that there really are two different use cases. So there's a lot of people who try to characterize different flavors of NVM by, you know, the performance characteristics of the device or something like the access method or something like that. I tend to characterize them by the use case. So in the one case on the left um, is the well-known case where the storage device, you're accessing it as a storage device using sort of well-known, you know, POSIX-style um, access methods to access that non-volatile device. Sometimes we call this I.O., sometimes it's referred to as block, I don't know, there's different ways to think about it. The other is a more emerging category where there's an application that's actually accessing it as memory, where it does what I would call memory semantics. It reads and writes, loads and stores. And somehow those two different use cases want to be able to access all of the four cases I described before, uh, which are NVM devices attached to a, a local device, a local I.O. bus uh, attached to a memory bus, or the two use cases attached to a fabric, those two use cases being uh, remote storage and remote memory. So this is a picture um, that Doug contributed, so I'm going to put my Doug Voigt hat on and try to do justice to it, which I'll fail miserably at, but you get the point. This is the work that the SNEA um, programming model Twig is doing right now. Really what we've got is the, the programming model itself really describes from an application perspective what functions and features he should expect to be able to see uh, from an NVM device and how to go about accessing them. That's kind of a big picture takeaway from, uh, from this drawing here. I like it, again, because it focuses more on, on the consumer and how the consumer accesses the device and uses it, and less on the low-level plumbing and the details of, of uh, what's going on under the covers. The important point about this is that dotted line on the right where you start to see um, you know, accesses directly to persistent memory. The way this is shown right here is this notion of a PM-aware file system. And once a file has been opened, you, you can then imagine the case where an application or a consumer can read and write that physical device directly uh, without having to go through you know, sort of the underlying block semantics that you're used to seeing. It can actually be just a physical read and write style operation. And that gets pretty close to that use case that I showed on the right-hand side there, where users really just want to be able to access it as remote memory. So in the model being proposed here, will the current applications be need to be rewritten to take advantage of the persistent memory technology? Um, Yes, to some extent, I think that's true. The complexity turn, it turns out to be, you know, one of the notes that Doug gave me about this as well. It seems pretty straightforward, you read and write memory, but there is, in fact, complexity that's introduced by the fact that the fundamental characteristics of the device are different, namely it's persistent. So you have to somehow convey to the consumer or the application this notion that you have to tell me something about when you want that data committed to non-volatile memory. So there is some impact. It's not, not, not zero at all. 
Okay, um, this is the stack that we've been talking about in the Open Fabrics Alliance. There's a lot of plumbing there in that box labeled APIs, and I, I didn't want to try to take us through all of that because it's kind of a long conversation. But the message here really is that, again, just to drive home this point that what the API does is it exports the features available on a, of a given device over a particular interconnect, exports that upward to a consumer. And it's important that we get these APIs right, since if the consumer doesn't recognize the device and how to use it, it's of no value to them whatsoever. So there's a lot of work going on here. Um, accessing uh, existing known wires like InfiniBand or iWarp or Rocky or so on is done today through K-verbs. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in the Open Fabrics Alliance to define a set of APIs which are quote unquote wire agnostic um, and that are written in a, word, in a language that is uh, recognizable to the consumer. So I would encourage you to get involved in the work that's going on in the Open Fabrics Alliance there. Uh, okay, last point before I'm going to drag Stephen back up here. Working my way back down through the stack again. So we talked about the consumer a little bit. We talked about the APIs a little bit, which is where there's a lot of work going on. There's some corresponding work on the wire itself, the fabric semantics themselves, that are implied by the new definitions of the APIs that are emerging. And that is work that's going on right now in, for example, the IBTA. They're talking about where do, what do we have to change in terms of uh, on-the-wire protocols in order to support the kind of behaviors that you expect to see from a, from a, um, a non-volatile device. And we can see that, that work going on not only in the IBTA, but it's also being talked about in the IETF and some other places. So, um, you know, you put it together, we've got, you know, NVMe over RDMA today, that would be NVMe F, is that more? O F. You know what I'm talking about, NVMe over fabrics. Um, if we start talking about things that we need to change in order to get from uh, to persistent memory using RDMA style mechanisms, um, you get to what Stephen would call awesome squared, which is a, a great expression I kind of like. Okay, so I've taken you through the top layer, a little bit about consumers, talked about the APIs, started working my way through the infrastructure, got as far as networks, and I'm gonna make Stephen come talk about the IO bus PCI Express implications there, and the memory bus, and then through we'll close off with a discussion about uh, the media and the form factors below that. Thank you very much, Paul. You're on. Are we having fun yet? <laughs> journey through, journey through the wonderful <laughs> wonderland of the stack. So it would be very remiss of me and Amber Huffman and Peter Neufrick, Amber from Intel, Peter from Microsemi would beat me up if I didn't talk a little about where we are with NVM Express. Not all of this is totally persistent memory aware, but some of it is. And NVM Express as a protocol is probably gonna play a role, a pretty significant role around persistent memory. Exactly where we go with this is gonna depend a little bit, but I wanna touch on some of the things that are happening there. Uh, and and uh, just, to, just to lay them out. And not all of these are official NVMe. They're just things happening around that space. NVMe over fabrics, if you don't know what that is, where on earth have you been for the last six months, right? Pretty much. I'm not going to talk about it. Controller memory buffers. Uh, for those of you who were um, here on Monday, you might have seen it, the, the more technical talk I gave on Monday where I ran across the room doing general relativity. It was good. You should have been there. Um, the, talking about how do we present potentially memory semantics over the PCIe bus, right? We have something that does that already. It's called a PCIe bar. We've had them for pretty much as long as we've had PCI, let alone PCIe. But can we make them persistent? And if we do, what do we get? Well, we kind of get an NVDIM N on the PCIe bus. Is that interesting? Maybe it's not, maybe it is. Something to kind of tease out a little bit. And that's something that some of us are doing. And if you're interested in learning more, come and uh, chat to me um, a little later or or uh, ping me on email. Uh, and then also the last one is interesting, but different ways of talking to a solid state drive. So NVMe today is defined using LBAs, right? So regardless of what's behind the controller, regardless of the media, it doesn't matter if it's DRAM, NAND, Optane, Xenon, blah, blah, um, it presents to the host as a device that consists of a large number of LBAs. You format the drive for 4K or 512 or whatever it supports, and it says, I got a billion of these. Now, when you write to me, just tell me, you know, which LBAs you want to write to and give me a pointer to somewhere in memory and I can DMA in the data and I'll put it at those LBAs and later when you read back, okay? 
Now, that's a block device, right? It's based on logical block addresses. We do that with other protocols like uh, SCSI, right? But um, maybe there's other ways of talking to these devices that are still over PCIe, but maybe they're a key value store. Maybe I say I want to put an object. Interesting, but you know, objects don't have fixed sizes. That's a bit of a problem. It's still an interesting problem. Maybe one to tease out a little bit. Another one is to think about, well, what happens if I expose something that's more like the underlying media? What about if I say, hey, I'm not a block device. I'm a NAND device, and I got a lot of NAND behind me. I've got this much NAND, and the NAND has this page size and this block size, and you can erase the blocks, and you can program the pages. Maybe that's an API. Right? There's actually, I won't say standard, um, but there's actually quite a bit of work around something called Light NVM. If you don't know what it is, go look it up, open channel SSDs. Um, some very good work being done there. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting. Again, I, I, I'm not going to stand here and say it's right or wrong. It's just a, it's a problem that maybe needs some of us to go take a look at, tease out, and, uh, and see, what, see what comes out of it. So moving on to the media. You know, again, don't want to spend too much time on this today, but um, there's a lot of interesting memory coming from the taxonomy point of view. Like I said, I think NVMe, NVM is a superset. See, Jim is now going to go, that's it. That's why we don't call it NVM, because you cannot help putting an E on the end. And I just goddamn did it. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> NVM is basically all the solid state memory types, right? So everything that's there. Um, persistent memory is the stuff that's lower latency and byte addressable. So PM is a subset of NVM. And that includes things that are, are what I call DRAM drop-in. They're so fast, you could just pull DRAM out, put this stuff in, and the system will just run. It meets all the DDR spec timing requirements, right? Um, the stuff that's not quite that fast is stuff that we kind of, I kind of termed storage class memory. So it's still pretty fast. It's still persistent, but maybe it's not quite fast enough that it could just drop in where DRAM is today and have no noticeable impact in performance, right? The DRAM drop-in is a memory type interface probably. The NAND is obviously a block interface to the memory. And then the storage class is somewhere in between. These different memory technologies are all maturing at different rates. Everyone has their favorites. Some will come to market soon. Some will come to market later. I'm not going to stand here and tell you which ones are better. Okay, that's something that we all need to go figure out and work out what we can do with them. Form factors, form factors are very important. Um, SNE has done some really good work here trying to clean up some of the categories, uh, especially in the NVDIM area. So now we have categories of NVDIM and we're trying to educate the, uh, the industry around the taxonomy here. So we have NVDIM ends, which are basically DRAM devices but they have some kind of power hold mechanism, maybe a super cap or some kind of battery, and they typically tend to have a flash backing store. Right? Um, another potential for NVDIM is, is something like the Spintorque MRAMs of the world, and, and one of these pictures, the larger picture in that NVDIM end corner is something called Contuto, which is an IBM project for Power 8, Power 9 processors, uh, where they hang uh, essentially um, DIMs off the, uh, the memory uh, bus chip that they have, the Centaur, for those of you who are familiar with it. NVDIM-P is really uh, still a DIM form factor, but it doesn't use DRAM or things that are as fast as DRAM. It has to have some kind of controller in between, uh, and it basically presents something to the DDR interface. But obviously, if whatever is behind that controller is not particularly fast, there are repercussions for the system. You might go, I want some data but you're not going to get it in DRAM kind of times, and that has impacts on the system. I'm kind of working out what to do there. We have NVMe drives that are built out of not NAND. Anyone here who's an engineer? Mm -hmm. uh, not NAND is AMD, so they're AMD NVMe drives. That's my Boolean joke of the day. Thank you very much. And walks off the stage. Um, so AMD <laughs> NVMe SSDs, you know, we, we microsemi, we, you know, I did it. Uh, we have a, a product that's DRAM backed, so it's very, very fast. Uh, it's, it's quite expensive like, per gigabyte because it's DRAM, but I, as a research tool for understanding low latency NVMe devices, it's been absolutely awesome. And we've been you know, using that in the kernel community for Linux to work out you know, how do we get faster um, uh, performance out of the NVMe driver, for example. Uh, and then also just kind of helping to understand what, some of the things we might want to do in the block layer. Obviously, Optane is publicly um, announced. Um, it's an Intel product coming to market. Uh, that uses um, um, the uh, cross-point memory uh, instead of NAND, and it will also get very, very good performance. Right? Not quite as good as the DRAM, though. 
<laughs> and NAND NVMe, it was probably about the same actually, but anyway, get into that. NAND NVMe, great thing is happening. The ecosystem for NVMe drives is really, really increasing. There's really good drives from many vendors. And I think we, we kind of see that in the ecosystem that the people who are the system integrators are now going, okay, now I have a stable supply chain. Now I have alternate choices of vendors. Now I can start making you know, serious commitments of engineering resources to go build servers around NVMe and PCIe, go integrate those into my systems, comfortable that I'm not going to buy into a market that's not, or, or, or into a vendor supply situation that's not really there. So we kind of hit that critical mass, which is great. Form factors are very important. Uh, you know, on the, on the PCIe side, we have the, uh, yeah, the U.2 form factor, the two and a half inch for PCIe drives. Very nice form factor, good connector, potentially hot swappable. That's really, really good for front loaded storage systems where you may have to pop drives out, put them in and so forth. Uh, and there's you know, some good power, um, um, re, you know, the power supply uh, available to do that. So that's kind of useful. Um, I'm not going to go through all this, but this kind of summarizes like what we think in terms of um, the form factors, what they're good for and what they're fad for. The one point I want to take away from this slide is form factor impacts features on the tagline. The only tagline to remember from this slide uh, is there's no DMA engines on a DIM, right? So DIMs are great. They're memory. They're really close to the CPU, but they don't have a DMA engine. I had an awesome slide about DMA. It was awesome, right? But we don't have time to go through it. But basically, a DMA is like having a slave. It's like having a personal slave or a butler. Because basically what happens is you go, I'm going to go play golf. Slave, go do something really menial, like move data. And when you're done, give me a call. I'll come back, and I'll find out what the data was. Right? You don't have your very expensive instruction set architecture-based processor just doing loads and stores. Right? It can go do something else like play golf or crunch numbers for you to generate revenue. So, is that? Are we done? Oh, out of time, really? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we had more time. Is it 11:20? Oh, I thought we had 50 minutes. All right, we're done. Call to arms. A lot of work to do. What we have to do is not Sisyphean. It's never gonna. It's not never going to end. It's Herculean. I invite everybody to put in their best efforts to address some of those pieces. I'm sorry, we completely mistimed it. And uh, um, that's okay because you guys have a panel on Thursday morning. Yeah, right? that's right. We do so have a panel on Thursday morning. Come to the Thursday morning session and ask your questions there. Okay, there you go. Very sorry, guys. We can continue this.